This week at Starbase, SpaceX completed the stacking of the final module for their new launch tower. The catch arms on Tower 1 also underwent a rigorous series of testing, and over at the build site, we get our first look at fuel system changes for the Block 2 Starship. Now let's dig into this week's update. Friday morning began with calibrations for booster catch, with the tower's catch arms moving in and out before the carriage lowered them back down around test article B14.1. The arms performed several simulated catches on the test article before being raised up once more and set down to the side of the orbital launch mount on the tower's hard stop. Glass installation and steelwork continued on the new office building with the fourth floor's glass partway done. Steel stud framing of the smaller extensions is mostly complete on the second floor, and painters have been applying white paint to the steel ahead of the glazers. Late in the evening, Test Tank 16 was relocated to the Massey Outpost for a second round of testing. This test tank features a new iteration of the Starship aft skirt, which needs to be proven before flight. While Test Tank 16 was on the move, Test Article B14.1 was taken off the launch mount before being relocated to the Rocket Garden on Saturday morning. As the sun rose over the launch site, Module 8 was raised above the new launch tower. The module was then gradually guided into place. The first of Ship 33's propellant transfer tubes was relocated from Star Factory to Mega Bay 2 as assembly of the first Block 2 Starship continues. A second propellant transfer tube was brought in just a few minutes later. Early on Sunday morning, workers removed the ship quick disconnect from its mountings, cutting, grinding, and modifying the arm for Flight 5. Back at the build site, a third propellant transfer tube was brought into Mega Bay 2 for installation on Ship 33. With the three tubes going into Ship 33, this is the first sign that SpaceX is doing something different with the Block 2 ship's fuel lines. Work continued on calibrating the chopsticks on Tower 1 for booster catch. Making use of hold down chains and following a bit of actuator testing, the landing rails were raised at one end and then the other. A trio of hot dog style storage tanks arrived at the port of Brownsville in the afternoon. These tanks would be brought to the Massey Outpost later in the week. The ninth and final module of the new launch tower was brought to the launch site on Monday morning and set down in a staging area at the complex. After cleaning and grinding several sections of Tower 1's chopsticks, workers began adding reinforcement plates over their circumferential welds. Over at the Tower 2 site, the Saren's crane's main boom was lowered for inspection. Crews inspected one side, then the other, apparently giving everything the okay, and the crane's boom was raised back up. Test Tank 16 was lifted into the test cage at the Massey Outpost, where it will experience simulated flight loads. Steel work on the bridging structure between Star Factory and the office appears to be completed now, and glass installation was nearly complete on the fourth floor. Later in the evening, the installation jig for Starship's propellant transfer tubes was brought to the door of Mega Bay 2, revealing the new fuel transfer system for the Block 2 ships. The redesigned fuel distribution layout retains the combined sea level engine supply line and adds a dedicated feed line for each of the ship's vacuum engines. Just inside the door, Ship 33 could be seen as it was lifted off of the assembly stand inside Mega Bay 2, clearing the way for the fuel distribution line installation jig. The new jig was then brought over to the ship assembly stand. Part of the header tank liquid oxygen downcomer was lifted in Mega Bay 2 on Tuesday morning. This section of piping should connect to an already installed part of the downcomer that goes from the header tank to the common dome. This latest piece will feed down the side of the LOX tank where it will be connected to pre-installed routing in the yet to come aft section. With the stacking of Module 9 imminent, the elevator rails were lifted into Module 7 and 8 of the new launch tower, with the longer section for Module 7 going in first. The shorter piece for Module 8 was added two hours later. One of the new cryo tanks brought into port was delivered to the Massey Outpost, expanding the site's propellant storage. 
A new additional protective plate was added to the top of the booster quick disconnect cover, improving the housing's durability against Super Heavy's exhaust plume. After doubling up the gusset plates, workers began reinstalling the cladding that had been pulled off the base of Launch Tower 1. A worker on a lift was inspecting the bumper pads on the chopsticks before applying labels to them. After three straight months of on-site drilling, the continuous flight auger left the launch pad and was brought over to Sanchez. Workers began removing the bumper pads from the chopsticks on Wednesday morning, starting with the left stick before moving over to the right. It's not yet clear if this is due to an issue with how they performed, if SpaceX is removing them for further inspections, or if this current design is just not reusable. Crews finally finished removing the sixth pad from the tower before sunrise. Later, after dawn, the Saren's crane was hooked up to the ninth and final prefabricated module of the new launch tower. The section was then lifted and then slowly lowered into place, topping out the structure. While work on the foundation and base started much earlier, the first module was stacked on July 11th. With the final module now in place, that means that crews brought the structure of this new launch tower up to its full height in just six weeks after stacking the first pre-assembled module. While there is still a lot of welding and concrete work remaining until the final structure work is complete, this rapid pace has been quite impressive. Over at the Massey Outpost, the top hat fixture used to apply compressive forces to test articles was placed on Test Tank 16. Meanwhile, the second cryo tank was delivered from the docks at Brownsville to the Massey Outpost. The newly repaired ship quick disconnect was extended for the first time, beginning a battery of panel arm and swing arm testing that ran through the night. As part of the ongoing effort to reconfigure the propellant storage farm for both launch pads, two liquid nitrogen pumps were removed from the methane side of the facility. Shortly after sunrise on Thursday morning, a Mechazilla logo was added to Ship 30, noting the mission's expected catch attempt with the booster. A small rectangular box has been added near the starboard flaps actuator mechanism, which appears to be covered in cork insulation. A second one is also present on the port side of the ship. These boxes may be spectrometers for studying the re-entry plasma around the starship. Making use of a transport cart, an autogenous pressurization line was brought out from Star Factory and taken to Mega Bay for installation. With the last tower module mounted and in place, the load spreader was detached and later brought down from the tower. It was set down in a staging point farther away from the tower now that it's no longer needed. This week at the Cape saw Falcon 9 Booster 1073 taken off the dockside stand on Friday and laid horizontal for transport back to Roberts Road. Support ship Shannon departed Port Canaveral heading off for Tampa, likely in preparation for recovery operations for the upcoming Polaris Dawn mission. Bob then returned to port with both fairing halves from the Worldview Legion 3 and 4 launch, which lifted off the day before. Signet Warhorse 3 towed a short follow Gravitas out to sea on Sunday ahead of the Starlink Group 10-5 mission. And less than an hour later, Bob joined the tug and drone ship in support of the same mission. Two days later, Falcon 9 Booster 1085 made its debut launch, carrying the Starlink Group 10-5 mission into orbit on Tuesday. Bob returned to port on Thursday, carrying both fairing halves from the Starlink launch. For reasons unknown, Go Cosmos departed Port Canaveral, making a beeline out of the docks. The Polaris Dawn crew performed multiple flybys of historic Launch Complex 39A ahead of their expected launch on August 27th. This is the first of three planned launches for the Polaris program. Jared Isaacman, Scott Poteet, Sarah Gillis, and Anna Menon will make the highest altitude flight since the Apollo program at about 1,400 kilometers. Passing through portions of the inner Van Allen belt, they will study the effects of spaceflight and radiation on human health. They will also use the new suits developed by SpaceX to perform a spacewalk at an altitude of about 700 kilometers and perform various other experiments and research along the way. The mission is planned to end with splashdown on September 1st. 
Go Cosmos returned to port a few hours later with an empty deck. Signet Warhorse 3 towed a short fall of Gravitas and Booster 1085 back to port from the Starlink Group 10-5 launch. This booster will be refurbished for the launch of Crew-9, currently scheduled to launch on September 24th. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching, Lab Padre out.